I'm Sonia Bookman. As a cultural sociologist, I'm interested in how crime films represent Canadian cities and contemporary urban life through the lens of crime and criminality. What do crime films tell us about Canadian cities, specific neighborhoods, and the people who inhabit them? Where do crimes take place? And where is crime out of place? What kinds of crimes occur in different cities and urban environments? Who's involved in criminal activity? And how are they situated in the city? In this episode, I explore some of these questions by focusing on the urban imaginary in Canadian crime films. Imaginary refers to the ways in which a particular city and the people who inhabit it are imagined. It encompasses the various sets of meanings, ideas, and feelings attributed to a place and its people. Canadian sociologist Rob Shields talks about how places take on meaning through their representation in popular culture forms like novels, newspapers, television, or film. For Shields, such representations help to establish what he calls place myths or the stories that circulate about and help to define certain places as romantic or tough, creative or cold. For example, think about the city of Paris. How has your view of Paris been shaped by watching films like Midnight in Paris by Woody Allen, which highlights the city's bohemian romantic character with images of rainy cobblestone streets, writers and art? The way places are imagined in film matters. Urban scholar Mark Jane argues that films inform and mediate our knowledge, understanding, and experience of urban life. In other words, the way that we see cities on the screen affects how we come to know, relate to, and encounter urban life. Place has always played a prominent role in Canadian film. Historically, Canadian cinema has featured natural landscapes like the Rocky Mountains or prairies in representations of Canadian life and culture. Over the past few decades, however, Canadian films have provided us with new kinds of depictions, focusing on cities and the plurality of urban experience. George Melnick, a Canadian film scholar, notes how such works are characterized by an urban imaginary perspective that reflects the way Canadian filmmakers have imagined Canadian cities and the people who live and work there. Many crime films are now filmed in and feature Canadian cities and urban life, set in Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, or Winnipeg. Place is not only a backdrop for crime in these films, but plays a role in telling the crime story. For instance, it can mark boundaries that tell us which urban spaces are dangerous or safe, where criminal activity happens, and what kinds of crime we might encounter there. At the same time, depictions of city crime shape our ideas and feelings about urban environments, invoking fear of particular neighborhoods, or imagining whole cities as cold and crime-ridden. Canadian crime films set in and featuring Toronto over the past two decades show three distinct urban imaginaries. Most common, films such as Owning Mahoney, Bone Cop, Bad Cop, and Foolproof tend to imagine Toronto as a cold, northern, capitalist city where crime is a sophisticated, calculated pursuit. For example, Foolproof by Canadian director William Phillips and starring Ryan Reynolds is about a group of friends in dead-end service sector jobs who spend their spare time scheming but never carrying out complex foolproof heists. They're blackmailed by a real British gangster who coerces them into performing an actual bank robbery. But always one step ahead, the friends make sure that the gangster's caught while they escape with nothing in their old reliable blue car. The caper unfolds in the financial district with shots of gleaming high rises and office buildings portraying Toronto as a well-off capitalistic city. The friends meet at a city square near the concert hall where light snow invokes the cold. While the gangster operates out of his upscale restaurant, the high-end, sophisticated crime, not quite white-collar, but not a street crime either, takes place in a central bank tower. 
Criminal activity happens primarily in liminal spaces like empty apartments or parkades, or in what French anthropologist Marc Auger refers to as non-places. These locations, such as airports, corporate banks, or nondescript offices, are not really relational or historical or concerned with identity, as sociologist Stephen Miles points out. They're defined by their link to the global economy and their lack of community. Non-places could be in any city anywhere. Delegated to these spaces, crime is detached and displaced from everyday urban life in the prosperous post-industrial city. A second type of urban vista can be seen in the Karn artist, or Picture Claire. These films depict Toronto as a creative cosmopolitan city where crime is improvised and crafted. For example, the Karn artist, directed by Riza Bramon Garcia, begins with Karn artist Vince, played by Rossif Sutherland, recently released from prison, heading to Toronto to start a new life. From the bus window, Toronto's streets are lined with skyscrapers, small shops, and public art. Dragged back into gang life, Vince makes his plans to escape using his skills as an artist. He's invited to an art gallery where he appears out of place, but observes the rip-off schemes of art dealers who are shown making a buck by exploiting artists and customers alike. Vince realizes that he too can play this game. His transformation from criminal to artist shows that these are not so different after all. In these films, criminal activity again occurs in liminal spaces, but also in ordinary working class places like the mechanic's garage. While out of place in Toronto's middle class art worlds, crime is still intertwined with the city's edginess and creative energy. In this creative city, those who show craftiness in art and crime are rewarded rather than punished. Finally, a handful of independent and made-for-TV films imagine Toronto as a culturally diverse city comprised of distinct ethnic enclaves and characterized by strong ethnic communities and gangs. This image is especially developed in the Chasing Kane series of movies directed by Toronto-based Jerry Ciccariti. For example, the first Chasing Kane film opens at the scene of a murder in Toronto's Chinatown, where detectives encounter a chaotic crowd and a perpetrator who, in broken English, confesses that he killed his brother over a ping pong game. However, the rest of the film focuses on a different crime, the murder of a Croatian woman who is married to a Serbian man. It follows the homicide detectives back and forth from their temporary desk at the local crowded police station to the Serbian inner city neighborhood where they interview the victim's relatives and friends. The urban neighborhood is marked as a tight knit community with images of regulars at a local Serbian restaurant playing cards, a family home filled with religious and national symbolism, and even references to a gypsy curse. The victim was preparing to leave her husband and his mother had her murdered for disloyalty to the family and community. Like Stephen and Andrea mentioned in the case of the Canuck cop film, the detectives in this film are not only trying to solve a murder case, but they're also policing the cultural boundaries of Canadian urban life in an increasingly multicultural context. The mainstream Canadian sounding detectives interview Serbians and Croatians with strong accents, marking the ethnic enclave as other. Reflecting on the neighborhood, one detective states, it's a nice street, to which the other responds, as long as you're not trying to leave. This suggests that the Serbian community is not only different, but is also somehow deviant. The crime is un-Canadian. So although the film offers a much more diverse image of Toronto than say Foolproof does, it still reinforces a predominantly white, mainstream Canadian cultural norm via the police, who makes sense of the variety of ethnic cultures for the audience. The three images of Toronto that surface through these films present different facets of Toronto and its criminal life. They provide different urban imaginaries that mediate how we come to know, understand, and experience the city. Of course, this doesn't mean that audiences imagine the city in the same way as the filmmaker. 
But thinking critically about these images means reflecting on their limitations, examining the stereotypes they may draw on and reinforce, noting the spatial boundaries that they construct, as well as exploring how they represent Canadian culture and identity. Consider these questions as you watch the films. <laughs> 